When police arrived at a West Palm Beach, Florida home on June 15th, 1955, they were met with a disturbing scene. The porch light was shattered and there were blood drops on the walkway to the beach. Police would locate and identify two used spools of adhesive tape. One was on the beach and one in the couple's living room. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Maneater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings of the world, you know what to do. Let's get started. Fifty-six-year-old Marjorie Chillingworth and her husband Curtis Chillingworth were last seen at a dinner in West Palm Beach in Florida on June 14, 1955. They left dinner at approximately 10 p.m. to return home, but after that, neither of the Chillingsworths have ever been heard from again. Marjorie and her husband Curtis had three children, and their life was pretty good up until this point. Marjorie belonged to a local garden club in 1955 and had even won awards for her flowers. Curtis was considered retired by the time that he disappeared. He had made quite a fortune on land investments on top of his $18,000 a year salary as a judge. Because this is 1955, $18,000 in today's cash would probably be equivalent to around $200,000. So the family, by all means, was quite wealthy. Curtis was the senior circuit judge of Palm Beach County, and he took his job quite serious. Curtis had gotten the job at the age of 26, and he was the youngest person in Florida history to do so. But there was one judge who didn't take his job so serious, and Curtis was well aware of this. Joseph Alexandra Peel Jr. was the municipal judge for the West Palm Beach in 1955, and quite frankly, he was noted for his corruption and his incompetence. It turns out in 1953, Peel had represented both sides in a divorce case, and Curtis told him it was his last chance and he would face disciplinary action the next time he screwed up. And unfortunately, Joseph Alexander Peel was incredibly angry at this. On the morning of June 15th, 1955, Curtis and his wife had hired a carpenter to build a playground for their grandchildren at their home. The carpenter had arrived at schedule at around 8 a.m., but the house seemed to be deserted and the door was open. Curtis was scheduled to preside over a hearing in West Palm Beach at around 10 a.m. that morning, but he had never arrived. That's when authorities were sent to search the Chillingworth residence at around noon and they noticed right away that something was wrong that porch light was smashed there was drops of blood on the walkway to the beach the adhesive tape they found on the beach and in the living room they knew that curtis and marjorie were in danger it appears that the couple's swimsuits had been left behind as was some cash and curtis's car was located at the residence with the key still in the ignition and after an extensive search no one could find the couple unfortunately they were declared legally dead in 1957 and were given a headstone in Oak Lawn Cemetery in West Palm Beach. But then in 1960, detectives seemed to make some headway with the case. They would arrest Joseph Alexandra Peel Jr. for the murder of the Chillingworths. And if you remember, Joseph Peel was that judge that Curtis had said he was going to discipline if he continued to screw up. In retaliation, Joseph Alexandra Peel would hire a man known as Floyd Albert Lucky to kill the Chillingsworths. Floyd, who we'll call Lucky, did confess to the murders in 1960. He stated that him and a friend, George David Bobby Lincoln, had killed the couple together, and both men were soon arrested. George David Bobby Lincoln had already been incarcerated in a federal prison on unrelated charges by this time, and he was granted immunity from prosecution for the murders in return for agreeing to testify as a witness. Lucky would plead guilty to both murders and agree to testify against Peel. He was sentenced to death. At Peel's trial, he would testify that him and his friend had taken the couple out into the ocean on a boat, taped their hands, strapped lead weights to their bodies, and threw them overboard still alive. They said that Curtis was still able to swim in spite of his hands being taped and the weight. So they would hit him with a shotgun, but he continued to float. Unfortunately, they would pull him back onto the boat and put on an additional weight before he sank. And during the trial, they would state that they never received payment for the murders. Shockingly enough, Joseph Alexander Peel Jr. was only convicted of being an accessory to Curtis's murder, and he pleaded no contest to his role in Marjorie's death. He would serve 18 years in Florida State Prison, and then he was released in 1979 to serve a federal sentence in Missouri for an unrelated mail fraud conviction, but he was paroled in 1981. By the time he was released, he would die only nine days later 
from cancer. A few days before his death, he gave a newspaper interview where he stated he had not ordered the Chillingsworth murders, but he had been aware of them and had done nothing to stop them, which is quite fascinating because the other men had no reason to kill the couple. The only reason they were there is because of Joseph Alexander Peel Jr. Lucky's death sentence was eventually commuted to life in prison in 1966, and apparently he was a model prisoner and died while he was still incarcerated in 1996. His friend George David Bobby Lincoln finished his federal prison term in 1962 and would later die in 2004. Unfortunately, their bodies have never been recovered, and this case is incredibly chilling. The Chillingsworth murders were just incredibly sad and unnecessary, and Peel certainly played down his role in what happened to the couple. In our next case, a two-year-old boy would disappear from a supermarket in Long Island, New York on October 31st, 1955. Stephen Craig DeMann was last seen on October 31st, 1955. He was at a supermarket in East Meadow, Long Island, New York, with his mother and his sister, which was a block and a half from his home. Stephen's mother left him and his sister, who was in a carriage, outside the supermarket for approximately 10 minutes while she shopped for bread. When Stephen's mother found her bread and came outside, she was shocked to see that both of her children were simply gone. Eventually, Stephen's sister was found still inside her carriage a few blocks away, but unfortunately, Stephen has never been seen or heard from again. But then in late November of 1955, a student at Queens College in New York City wrote three letters demanding money from Stephen's parents in exchange for the toddler's safe return. Each letter continued to progressively ask for more amounts of money. The first one was $3,000, then $10,000, and then $14,000. Although Stephen's parents wanted to comply, the student turned out to be obviously a con artist who had nothing to do with Stephen's presumed abduction. It was even suggested that Stephen might be the boy in the box or America's unknown child. And many of you know that's the small boy who was found dead inside a cardboard box in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1957. They both were blonde and blue-eyed and had the same scars, but the unidentified boy did not have a healed arm fracture as Stephen, and Stephen's footprints had been taken when he was a baby, and they did not match the Philadelphia child. And then in 2003, police were able to rule conclusively that Stephen was not the boy in the box. They did take DNA from Stephen's sister, and compared it to that of the boy in the box. Stephen's family is originally from Iowa. His father was in the Air Force in 1955, and the family was then stationed on Long Island. His father would leave the Air Force a few months after Stephen's abduction, and the family returned to Iowa. But his parents would divorce in 1957, and both of them would later remarry. His mother now lives in Missouri, but his father still lives in Iowa and has had two sons by his second marriage. And of course... The case would receive national media attention in 2009 when a Michigan man claimed he was Stephen, but DNA tests ruled out that possibility. And unfortunately, there's very little evidence to indicate what happened to Stephen. Again, this was 1955, so camera footage unavailable. They would just have to work off eyewitness statements. And of course, because this was 1955, things were done differently. I mean, the mother went into the store. She felt comfortable leaving her seven-month-old daughter in the carriage while her two-year-old son kind of stood by with her. I do find it odd that someone, I guess, initially decided to perhaps abduct both of them and then later just took Stephen. Perhaps Stephen was the one that pushed his sister a little ways down the street. Maybe he decided to walk home. Maybe he got confused and then somebody abducted them a little ways away. I mean, he could have easily gotten lost in the city. There's just so much that could have happened to him. At the time of his disappearance, Stephen had a small scar under his chin and a birthmark resembling a mole on the back of his left calf. He has a healed fracture to his left arm. And at the time of his disappearance, he would walk with his toes turned out. And his nickname is Stevie. Of course, if you have any information about what happened to Stevie, you can contact the Nassau County Police Department at 516-573-7000. 33-year-old Aletha Capps was last seen in Douglas County, Colorado on December 17, 1955. She was last with Alva C. Quallen Jr. at this cafe in Victor, Colorado, but unfortunately they were refused service because they were under the influence. According to Alva Quillen, who was the last person to see her alive, he said that him and Aletha went for a drive and that their car skidded off the road and got stuck in a snowbank. 
He said the two of them stayed in the car overnight, and the next day he hiked over a mountain to Palmer Lake to get help. When he returned to the vehicle, he said that Aletha was gone. Unfortunately, extensive searches of the area turned up no sign of her. Initially, authorities were quite suspicious of Alva and his story about what happened that evening, and that only heightened when he failed the polygraph test. They firmly believed that he knew where she was, and then he would change his story just slightly. He would say that Aletha had a heart attack after their car got stuck, and she disappeared when he went to get help. Unfortunately, her body has never been found, and no one has ever been charged in her disappearance. And the friend that was with her that night, Alva, died in 1992. The thing is, Aletha did suffer from a heart condition, and she required medication several times a day. And due to that condition, she could only walk a short distance without collapsing. For all we know, this man was telling the truth. Perhaps, you know, they did get in a car accident, she had a heart attack, and he went for help, and maybe Aletha got out of the car, and she walked a short distance away and then collapsed. Or perhaps something more sinister happened. And although our final case doesn't have a lot of information about it, I really think it's important to share. And that's because the son of the person that disappeared spent his whole life trying to find out what happened to his father before he eventually died in 2014. 33-year-old Dwayne Roy Dreyer was last seen in Mason City, Iowa, at around 7.30 p.m. on November 7, 1955. Although he may have been seen at around 12 noon the next day, walking north on South Federal. Apparently, he told somebody that he was going to Chicago, Illinois. His car was found parked downtown by Willow Creek with all of his belongings inside, and the vehicle had a parking ticket on it dated November 8th. Eventually, authorities would drag the Willow Creek, but they found no sign of him. Dwayne had served on several ships in the Navy during World War II, including in the Soviet Union, before returning home. He would marry a local woman in 1945 and had a son, but they would divorce in 1947, and he would remarry and had two more children before he went missing. Since his disappearance, his social security number has been inactive. He never claimed unemployment benefits or the veterans' benefits after 1955, and unfortunately, his case remains unsolved. But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video or any other video on my channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. If there's a case you'd like me to cover, pop it in the comments below and I'll be sure to get to it. In the meantime, check out some other videos on my channel while you wait for the next upload and I'll see you then.